So I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. Is a uh, I'm very happy uh, to also feeling like I'm in Trieste right now instead of London. I don't know how is the weather there. He is fall. Rainy. Yeah. Rainy and gloomy. Rain. Okay, so it's better here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I have uh, chosen this topic because it is uh, it has a good balance of um, basic uh, introduction and potential for clinical translation. And is uh, uh, the uh, devo parlare in inglese o in italiano? English or Italian? English, please. Okay, the it's been the the topic uh, of my research group over the past. <clears throat> 10 years. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I need to highlight that I am co-founder and uh, shareholder of Angetics Therapeutic, which is a spin out uh, from uh, UCL, from the Institute of Liver Digestive Health, and um, is basically the translation of our academic research into potential clinical application, particularly drug discovery. <clears throat> So uh, I'm sure that you know about, you know, the cellular matrix, but I would like just to refresh some concepts. So uh, the uh, ECM as a molecular network composed, composed of three major components, proteins, glycosaminoglycans and glycoconjugates. Um, the component of the ECM interacts with cell adhesion receptor called integrin to form the tissue network uh, where the cell are resident. And the uh, cell adhesion receptor transduce signal into the cells from the ECM, thus regulating T cell function. So basically there is a, a very intimate relationship between the cell embedded into this um, extracellular matrix. And uh, another important concept is that uh, just, just to propose the non-passive role of the extracellular matrix is that the ECM is also a key depository of soluble factors which are active in physiological and pathological condition, particularly growth factors, cytokines, and other factors. So <clears throat> there are um, different type, different structure of the ECM component. For example, the proteoglycans, uh, are a, a protein which are made of a core protein and a glycosaminoglycan chain. There are different types, and they have, a, uh, as you can see, for their structure, they have the possibility to adapt uh, in different conditions, in different three dimensional structure, and interact with the cell membrane. Um, on the other hand, the fibrous protein are the, the collagens, which are the most representative also in terms of dimension fibronectin, tenacin, and elastin, uh, which is very important in some tissue, but it becomes a feature of very chronic uh, accumulation of, of uh, ECM, typical of tissue fibrosis. The function of the ECM are uh, summarized in this slide. So besides uh, role in differenti differentiation and growth, maintenance of the tissue structure, morphogenesis, Angiogenesis and so on, but the two most important features that are relevant for today's presentation is the response of the ECM to uh, tissue damage and contribution to remodeling, and uh, you know on a parallel uh, page response to injury and trauma. So this is basically a derangement or an alteration of this response, which is a very physiological response, leads to. Uh, consequences which are features of chronic diseases, particularly chronic disease of the liver. Uh, <clears throat> there is a difference between um, the so-called ECM in the basement membrane and the interstitial matrix. Basement membrane is in close contact with the uh, uh, cells, in particular the epithelium uh, or endothelium, as you see, I see here, and there's a, um, the, uh, the the cell of the epithelium interacts with the basal membrane through integrins. Uh, what is below into, into the more like a dense structure of the tissue is the interstitial matrix, which is populated by um, uh, fibroblasts fibroblast or myofibroblasts, depending from the tissue, which are responsible for the turnover of the extracellular matrix. 
Uh, there are 28 type of collagens and uh, they, they have a different structure and relevance depending if they are closer to the cell, uh, uh, to, to the cell of the tissue, uh, you know, around the, bas the basal membrane, as you see here in this uh, pink uh, triangle. And they, be, they have a different structure if they are in the interstitial matrix, as you see here. So for example, all the major collagen, collagen one, two, three, four, uh, and so on, are typical of the interstitial matrix. And they are far away from the basal membrane. So there is a kind of a functional separation between the collagens that needs to be close to the cell and collagen that needs to be far away from the cell and that, that constitute the rigid structure of the tissue. Uh, what happens in tissue fibrosis is that uh, the collagens, which usually are in the interstitial matrix, the fibrous collagen, like one, three, and so, they become more, more and more abundant and they tend to invade the area that normally is uh, occupied by collagen typical of the basal membrane. So uh, where does the story uh, start? Um, the, uh, a very important step in understanding the extracellular matrix of a tissue in normal condition or in disease condition is to obtain uh, a scaffold of the tissue. That means removing all the cells and leaving the extracellular matrix structure uh, without altering the biochemical and mechanical composition. It is not a research that started uh, centuries ago. Actually, the first success was in 2010 for the, with the production of an all rat liver scaffold. Uh, tw uh, 2011 is a, a, a ferret, which is not very different from a rat. Major step was obtaining a scaffold of an old liver, old, old pig liver. And uh, in our lab, uh, Giuseppe Mazza was well, my PhD student, was able to produce the scaffold of a, of a human liver uh, that had been discarded from transplantation for uh, over his chemia time. So this is the first example of um, human liver scaffold. Uh, we have been developing uh, a technique to uh, achieve all organ desolarization, not just for the liver, which is here. So this was a liver of 1.8 kilos, so it was huge. And uh, you can see at the end of the process, the amount of DNA is uh, over a minimum threshold, meaning that there are no cells. And the uh, uh, three-dimensional structure of the tissue is see here. Uh, the, the, the top panel is always the original organ, and the, the, the lower is the decellularized organ. So the different structure portal tract are all maintained also in the decellularized organ. Uh, we have been able to um, obtain also all human pancreas. The paper has been accepted last week. Uh, and, uh, and also we have been able to obtain all human kidneys. And for this, we have collaboration with uh, the nephrologist, but also um, in order to make this tissue available for uh, lab research, we have been developing a technology where the scaffold, we can obtain directly mini scaffold from uh, a five millimeter cube of normal human liver or cirrhotic human liver, as you can see here. We can obtain the relative scaffold. The scaffold maintains the three-dimensional structure and the proportion of the different uh, ECM components, you see here, collagen one, three, four, fibronectin, and laminin, they're all distributed where they should be. We have been, uh, you know, uh, using uh, the explanted uh, cirrhotic liver, you know, that we get uh, when the patient is transplanted, and obtain also cirrhotic scaffold. We have also uh, work and we have active research on uh, um, scaffold from human intestine. Uh, normal, normal or intestine with uh, uh, fibrostenosis in Crohn's disease. And also in collaboration with uh, Professor Bellotti, that now is back to Pavia, but was here at the Royal Free. We have been working on uh, uh, making the cellularization of uh, amyloid human heart or to, uh, to understand what is the relationship between amyloid and the extracellular matrix, which resulted in very uh, important results since the amyloid is actually 
like plaster over the normal uh, structure, make, making the tissue extreme, extremely rigid, but not really affecting the composition of the ECM. So it's an addition to the ECM, making the, the, the resulting tissue rigid, and in the case of the heart, uh, not contracting properly. Uh, we have uh, developed different applications. Uh, so the application go from uh, um, uh, the dream uh, that to make a new organ, the old organ engineering, so basically repopulate the scaffold with uh, liver cells to make a new liver, which is something that is very academic and also very long term. We have been um, developing uh, these cubes for uh, uh, tridimensional disease modeling. We have been uh, working on um, uh, implantable liver tissue, so basically repopulating this the small scaffold <clears throat> uh, for um, implantation, you know, as an alternative to hepatocyte transplantation. And also, we have developed a bio inks from the extracellular matrix for uh, 3D bioprinting. So I will show you um, aspect all this uh, point. So first of all, the all organ engineering. Uh, what is the potential application of this is basically improving hepatocyte transplantation and uh, working towards a bioengineered liver. Uh, I, I must, uh, I must uh, anticipate that <clears throat> this program was going very fast uh, until uh, March 2020. Uh, and uh, it was going fast because I had about 25 people working in the lab, they were working in an eight hour shift. So also during the night and also during the weekends. And obviously this had to be stopped because of the pandemic. <clears throat> and uh, most of those people went back to their original countries and also because we had to close the lab, the facility for six months. And when we reopened, the occupancy per room was like two people in a room where normally were eight people working before. So. What I'm showing now about this part of the work is something that is hanging, you know, uh, waiting for better times and more people coming to work. <clears throat> so why uh, we should make a human liver scaffold when there is an abundance uh, of uh, uh, pig liver scaffold? So, you know, this question has been asked to me many times. Uh, why you wanna you wanna um, get all the complication of obtaining uh, a suitable liver uh, liver from for transplantation and you know go through all these ethical issues when you can just get pigs and make pigs uh, liver scaffold and then repopulate with human human cell make a humanized engineer organ and uh, and then use that for transplantation. The problem is that uh, the pig liver is not structurally similar to human liver. So if you look at the, in this panel A, this is uh, how uh, collagen, uh, collagen one and three, so uh, fibrillar collagen are distributed around the lobules of, of a pig liver, and which in human would be already a form of liver fibrosis. So uh, the assumption is that if you um, introduce an engineer pig liver into a human recipient, you will have immediately very high portal pressure. And, um, and this has been, you know, we have indirect proof of this, but uh, it, for me, uh, this will represent a major limitation. So uh, if it's possible, uh, I would suggest that this should be done with human scaffold. So this is uh, to show you why we need all these people. This is uh, uh, um, Organ recellularization setup. It was over to a big room in a, in a big lab with uh, different incubators. And, uh, and here you see uh, in very simple term how uh, the uh, original human liver looked like, front and retro. And then this is at the end of the decellularization. And then, you know, in this case, we did a repopulation with FG2 cells, which are not normal hepatocytes, but it was a proof of concept because also we were proposing to repopulate the liver through the hepatic vein, not through the portal vein. And 
and uh, and this is how the liver look at the end of uh, a 48 hours uh, repopulation. So only repopulation with FG2 cells as a proof of concept. And as you can see here, uh, this is uh, uh, the cells that enters into the liver lobule through the uh, central lobular vein. And the diffusion is from the central vein to, you know, to, through the portal tract. And uh, as you can see here, the, there was almost a complete repopulation of many of the lobules. This is a central lobular vein. So the cells are coming out of here and they go into the, into, into the lobule. And uh, at the end of the repopulation, which is day zero, uh, we start measuring uh, albumin, human albumin. And you see clearly that there is already some increase at day one and a very significant increase at day three, meaning that the cells that have repopulated the scaffold are functional. They produce albumin. And uh, uh, we, uh, the next step was to infuse, uh, to do a repopulation with endothelial cells. But this, we, this was uh, basically blocked by the pandemic. So this would be the next step. So this is very preliminary, but very encouraging. Particularly, uh, we have proved that it's possible to do a repopulation by perfusing through the hepatic veins, not through the portal vein. <clears throat> Some example about implantable liver tissue or the, and the bio inks. So um, when could we use uh, bioengineer hydrogel and tissue implant for pediatric condition like the inborn, inborn error of metabolism, I'm sure you are familiar with. And also in adults in acute liver failure <clears throat> due to different um, causes, uh, but also in cirrhotic patient with acute and chronic <clears throat> liver failure or in other condition like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and, and so on. So these are the potential application of implant and hydrogels. <clears throat> so we <clears throat> originally started uh, comparing uh, the, the new decelerized scaffold, the, the, the five millimeter cube. And uh, these are the, basically the advantages and disadvantages. It's implantable only uh, process exact tissue specific ECM composition and microarchitecture but the cells need a long time to migrate into the cube and accommodate and have it, and has, this has all, also very low scalability. So we um, went uh, into a, the production of hydrogel. So by lyophilizing uh, the, uh, the, the native scaffold and reconstituting with a, uh, with a, uh, with, with a uh, hydrogel solution that we had uh, designed, and we, um, we had this uh, produced liver ECM hydrogel. Uh, in, in, a, in a further step, we um, uh, uh, used into the, into the process nitrocellulose, which, is, which makes the, the, the hydrogel, I mean the gel, you know, a potential bioink, and the nitrocellulose protects uh, the cell when they are printed because the printing occurs with some high pressure. So the advantages of, uh, sorry, the advantages of the uh, uh, ECM hydrogel is that you know, uh, they have high scalability, but the cells still need time to migrate and accommodate in the hydrogel. Where you know, the, 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 the ECM bioink for the 3D printing has high scalability, and the cells are mixed with the ink before the printing. So uh, we have done experiment with uh, N equal 360. So we, we, you have very high repeatability and scalability. And the number of cells that are in each drop 3D printed is exactly the same uh, you know, with the other uh, wells. So <clears throat> um, depending what we, need to do right now we are using either hydrogel or 3D printing. And most of this is done now with this in the spin out company that needs to have uh, very high numbers for track target validation. So this is uh, what I was saying before, the scaffold is lyophilized and is then, um, is then reconstituted into a gel. 
And if you look inside the gel, you do immunohistochemistry of the gel, you see that uh, all the different components of the ECM are represented, and they obviously they don't look like it in, in, in the in the 3D structure of the liver, but they're all represented in this sponge-like structure, which you can see here. And a very important point is that the hydrogel is stable between 4 and 40 uh, degrees centigrade. So it doesn't need to be uh, refrigerated uh, if it's done, you know, experiment at room temperature, even in very, in very hot day in the summer. This is just an example how, uh, for example, hepatocytes look in these gels, they look fine. They have villi very well expressed. And so all these are more like uh, very suggestive pictures. Um, so, uh, the implantation of this uh, uh, ECM hydrogel needs to have a very important uh, characteristic, which is the biocompatibility. So uh, just to show this example, these are um, uh, hydrogels, which have been repopulated with FG2 cells. After seven days, they are ready for implantation in the omentum of uh, immunodeficient mice. This is uh, how it looks on day of implantation, and this is about three weeks. So it's very dark, but it's not uh, necrotic. It's actually very, very healthy and uh, vascularized. And as you can see here, uh, the, there is an expansion of this uh, uh, of this implant, you know, in the in the omentum. And as you can see here, and uh, starting uh, from the third day after implantation, uh, the mice uh, start to have detectable human albumin. Uh, level in the in the circulation, so meaning that these implants are not rejected and they are functional. <clears throat> we have been able to um, do bioprinting on cholangiocytes, and as you see here, this is the the day of the bioprinting, and this is about five days later where the cholangiocytes start to develop a lumen, so they be, they acquire polarity. Um, we are uh, we are collaborating with uh, uh, a group in Cambridge, Fortis Sampatiotis, uh, on bile duct engineering. We are producing the scaffold for the bile ducts, and uh, Fortis Lab they uh, basically um, provide all the other steps. And uh, <clears throat> this is a very promising area because uh, expand a lot the surgical capability in liver transplantation. You can. You can imagine uh, a donor liver of 1.6, uh, 1.8 kilos can be split into uh, uh, liver to be transplanted into recipient, but one of the recipient will not have bile ducts. So basically, the, um, the liver needs to be uh, attached to the intestinal wall. And so in this case, uh, we, 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 we are producing um, up to six uh, centimeters long bile ducts that can be used uh, to make this um, uh, transplantation more, more uh, suitable. Um, also, uh, we have interest in uh, uh, developing models uh, for um, uh, research of, on liver, uh, liver pathophysiology. For example, this is a uh, uh, another example of making uh, a thermosensitive poly polymer that basically becomes solid at some temperature. So we want we, we don't need to have it done uh, solidify immediately, but we want to wait a, a particular time. And you see here, this is repopulated with hepatic stellate cells, <clears throat> and uh, the, you can we can also show, show contraction. Although this is not contraction with the vasoconstrictor, it's contraction with PG beta. That means that there is cross linking of collagen. So from the control, the, 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 the spheroids becomes smaller. And, uh, and this is part of another project where we um, uh, uh, basically use all these spheroids to make cylinders, as you see here, and we put into a bioreactor. Uh, simulating sinusoids, and it's called sinuflow. And uh, the, the bioreactor has a pressure sensor to uh, detect changes in pressure, and also a biochemical sensor to detect changes in 
uh, biochemical uh, level of what we are interested. And this is uh, with the Wi-Fi, tra Wi-Fi transmission can be read on a, on a <clears throat> smartphone, but also we can uh, load the cells in this cylinder, with, for example, with a FURA uh, FLU4, which is an indicator of intracellular calcium. So we can uh, detect changes in cell contraction, increased pressure and uh, dynamic of intracellular calcium in, in the sinusoids. And finally, um, the part that is um, spin out in the company NGTX is the 3D disease modeling. The, the base, the background of this is uh, that right now in 2022, uh, after more than 35, 40 years of research in liver fibrosis, there is no licensed antifibrotic drugs for liver for li liver fibrosis. There are only three drugs which are um, uh, licensed for uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, but nothing for the liver. And uh, so the point is that the targets uh, for liver fibrosis were discovered by culturing stellar cell on plastic, as you can see here. And obviously there were hundreds of targets discovered and this was then transferred to animal models, uh, either you know, normal models or knockout models. So there was a huge uh, use of use and abuse of animal models, but there, is, there was no translation so far in, in anything. And uh, so the question is that did we pick wrong targets or uh, did we have a wrong validation methodology? So I think both. I would say both uh, questions are correct. So also another point that we were very much focusing on cell biology, intracellular signaling, everything that happens on cells, culture on plastic, without really considering what happens outside the cell, what is the microenvironment. So um, there are different points here, but um, the key points are uh, the need of 3D in vitro models. And, and this is what we have been trying to develop. So this is the, the 3D scaffold I showed you before, uh, which are bioengineered with hepatocytes, uh, either by incubating the scaffold with hepatocytes or putting the scaffold into a bioreactor with recirculating hepatocytes. And you see here the hepatocytes uh, enter into the so the scaffold, they occupy position around the central lobular vein as they will do. This they, initially they are attached to the surface, then they penetrate. And uh, it's interesting that um, uh, this is uh, uh, the black bar is plastic compared to uh, 3D culture. And you see uh, after seven days, the cell on plastic, if other cell on plastic make more albumin than the, the cell in the scaffold. But af after 14 days, uh, the cell on plastic, they die, and, and instead the cell in the scaffold, the cell in the scaffold, they make significantly more albumin. And we have data up to 80 days where uh, these cells, uh, hepatocytes, into, uh, into the scaffold are still alive and produce albumin. Uh, same thing we did with the uh, stellate cells. Stellate cells, as you can see, they enter you know, in the scaffold and they occupy sinusoidal. Uh, sinusoidal uh, position where they are normally located. And uh, another interesting thing is that uh, we all thought that collagen, pro-collagen one uh, in culture of stellar cell can go up 50 times. And this is not really the case. Uh, if you put the cells in a 3D system, the production of collagen is much less as uh, expected on the other hand. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, Collagen it is a prototype target, but there were many other targets which were exaggerated and artificially uh, increased in, uh, in on culture on plastic. So they need to be completely revised. And so we did a long study uh, re-evaluating uh, you know, a large number of targets uh, discovered in the past 30 years. And we found that um, basically 95% of the target uh, discovered on plastic were artificially 
uh, increase, and there were no increase or very mildly increase uh, in the 3D system. One example is uh, LOX, LOX uh, L2. Uh, nobody had been you know, considering to use, to consider this cross link enzyme as relevant uh, culture in the cell on plastic, because you see that the expression is very low, but it becomes very high when you put the cells on a 3D system, because on a 3D system, the cell, they have some gravity to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, bear. And so they need to go into a quick cross-linking to keep uh, the collagen and the cells you know, attached to, to the walls. And also we have been comparing um, the primary uh, stellar cell on uh, uh, healthy human liver scaffold and cirrhosis scaffold, showing that everything that happened on a cirrhosis scaffold is much more profibrogenic and much more uh, uh, going to a progressive, uh, more progressive and, uh, and large activation of the cell. And I mean, the, here we didn't discover anything because a cirrhotic liver, it is the most uh, relevant um, uh, environment promoting fibrosis. So, uh, but this was nice to see that this uh, can be confirmed with the scaffolds. <clears throat> so uh, after all this illustration, um, uh, considering that the standard has been, you know, up to now, culturing cell on plastic, and there were there, there were several um, uh, several uh, proposed alternatives, including organoids and 3D printed without extracellular matrix, and uh, the human scaffold were actually respecting fitting with all this uh, technology criteria, and uh, in addition to this, we have found and we have propose that uh, if you do 3D printing, cell 3D printing in ECM with uh, bio inks, which are made with the original uh, normal liver uh, ECM or you know, fibrotic liver ECM, you can also have uh, satisfaction of all these uh, technology criteria. So uh, let's, let's get to the hepatic matrizome. So, uh, here, I mean, it's basically what I showed you before, that we made uh, this uh, scaffold from human and, and cirrhotic liver. Uh, now there is this red thing, is something that is going on its own, sorry, it comes from a previous presentation. So but you look at the um, scanning electron microscopy, um, sorry, let me go back. So this is uh, uh, how uh, a uh, the cellularized liver looks. This is a portal tract with a hepatic vein, uh, uh, an artery, and a bile duct. And this is the rest is a liver lobule. These are individual hepatocellular spaces in normal liver. This is one space for one hepatocyte. <clears throat> it was quite nice to to show that is this very nice basket of ECM protein uh, in, around the hepatocyte. And when you look at cirrhotic liver, this is a space for one hepatocyte, which shows you know, a huge difference and rigidity and thickness. Uh, it's easy to understand how hepatocytes work with difficulty in, in a cirrhotic liver. So <clears throat> we have been comparing um, protein signature between uh, healthy uh, livers and cirrhotic liver, which have been decellularized. And we have shown that it's possible to identify unique protein, which are called quality signature, in cirrhosis scaffold with statistical significant change compared to healthy liver scaffolds. And uh, in addition, we, uh, these are all protein red, are uh, key protein that are uh, currently explored as potential uh, biomarkers. And uh, here, just to make it more easy, um, if we compare a healthy human liver uh, scaffold with a NAFLD scaffold and a PSC scaffold, you see the NAFLD and the PSC, they have their own unique signature. This 19 NAFLD and 14 PSC, which are not present in other chronic liver disease. And so <clears throat> there is a, uh, um, our vision is that we could develop uh, a biomarker which are specific for a specific chronic liver disease, not just like Fibro fibrosis biomarker for liver disease, but we can actually 
uh, discover a prognostic and diagnostic marker for individual individual uh, cognitive diseases. Another important concept is the matrikines. So in addition to be a depository of uh, soluble factor, the extracellular matrix also release, uh, I would say they are like bombs, which are called matrikine, uh, when they interact with uh, enzymes uh, that are normally uh, in, in physiology, and they are there for the remodeling of the ECM. In uh, path pathophys pathophys pathological condition, they are released by inflammatory cells. And so this matrikine have the possibility of interacting with cells through specific receptors. And these cells are mostly cells of the immune system. So there is a, a very important crosstalk between the extracellular matrix and uh, innate and uh, acquired immunity. And uh, so here uh, we did also a comparison, uh, healthy against fibrotic and uh, different uh, disease like alcoholic liver disease and PSC cirrhosis. And we see that each one of these uh, condition have specific uh, group of predominant matrikines. So also the way that the matrix communicate with the cells uh, is depending uh, in terms of uh, representation of, of matrikine from the etiology of the disease. So <clears throat> this leads to uh, introducing our spin-out company, which is owned in part by the university uh, and uh, was founded in 2016. It's now, it, the company was at the Royal Free for the first three years and then moved to his own uh, laboratory headquarter in West London. And the company interest is uh, uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which is an orphan cholestatic disease, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis in partnership with Takeda, intestinal fibrosis in IBD with a partnership with Takeda, and then two independent programs on hepatocellular carcinoma and pancreatic cancer. Um, basically, the Target research uh, derived from healthy or cirrhotic scaffold. So if you do the proteomic as of the scaffold, you get the matrisome as we discussed. If you uh, culture, uh, for example, stellate cells in the scaffold, you have, uh, you can do peptidomic analysis and RNA sequencing, and you have the secretome and the exome. If you do incubation with proteases, you do peptidomic analysis and you look at matricides. So these are uh, basically the basic the targets that we are uh, working on. So the matrisome is made of uh, the core matri matrisome genes, which are the collagens, the proteoglycans, the glycoproteins, and uh, as you know, we introduced. But importantly, there are matrisome associated genes, uh, which are, for example, all this protein here, the syndicans, lectins, and, and so on. And uh, then there are ECM, this include ECM affiliated proteins, uh, the ECM regulators, which are all the uh, transglutaminases, the releases, uh, the locks, the locks L1, locks L2, and ECM modif modifying enzymes and proteases. And, and then there are the secreted factor, which are uh, become embedded into, into the extracellular matrix, and particularly TJ beta and other profiter mm, that are, is, is a very long list. <clears throat> so uh, I, mean, I don't go into the detail, but we have a very strong um, uh, statistical data analysis software. It's called the NGTomics that basically allows to uh, differentiate um, difference between uh, samples or different uh, current liver disease or different stage of the disease. Um, just for example, this is, uh, uh, we have, you know, there is a, 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 a biobank which is uh, obtained by acquiring tissue uh, for um, commercial use from uh, the, the major providers. And uh, and this is uh, another example of the of the matrisome where you basically identify protein which are significantly overexpressed 
or significantly downregulated, and then you work, uh, you do research on each of these proteins to see how this could fit into a pathophysiological pathway. And uh, this is uh, the, the tissue we are using for fibrostenotic IBD. And uh, it's, it's uh, also the cellularized, so we use the scaffold of this. And uh, same here, you know, there is a data clustering, and there is a huge difference between healthy uh, intestinal tissue and, um, and uh, uh, fibrostenotic inflamed tissues. And, you know, and this is, uh, I won't go into detail of this, but uh, I mean, there is a very active research to find the difference between this diff different stage. So I think I am at the end. This is uh, uh, the lab uh, when, you know, uh, before the pandemic, and we had the pleasure to have people from all over the world, and it was a very uh, nice environment. And uh, a special thank is to Giuseppe Mazza, who was my PhD student, I took him from Florence. He was a master's student in biotechnology and I convinced him to come to London to do a PhD. And then he's co-founder with me of NGTX and is right now the chief executive. I think he's one of the youngest in the world. And uh, Prof. Krista Rombaus, who worked with me for 20 years, 10 years in Florence and 10 years in London. And uh, she is also fundamental for uh, contributing to this work. I think, uh, and this is uh, NGTX, uh, which is, I would say one third of the people in NGTX are my ex-PhD students. So they all got uh, a job in the company uh, after some selection, of course, but they were all good. It's Giuseppe and Luca Fringuelli and uh, uh, several, several other, like uh, this is uh, Dr. Bilia, uh, Maria Giovanna, also from Italy. And, um, and as you can see, uh, the company now has probably like double personnel, and these are all young people. And uh, we try to uh, maintain a very academic spirit. <clears throat> and uh, that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>